So we start chapter 12. It's entitled Radiation, Processes, and Properties. You don't get much out of that title. Let me try and unpack it. Thermal radiation is what we're interested in. There's a lot of radiation. Uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, you have gamma rays, or radio waves. No, we're interested in heat transfer, thermal radiation, and there's a section of that electromagnetic spectrum that's critically important for understanding thermal radiation or predicting it. And you can describe thermal radiation using, um, or micron is a measure of the wavelength. And so if you take a look at the wavelength measured in micron, the thermal radiation ranges between 0.1 micron and 100 micron, approximately. I mean, it's a good approximation. So right away, we're interested in that part of the electromagnetic spectrum important for thermal radiation. So in this chapter, we're interested in the process as well as properties. Uh, let me just say the two most important are the wavelength, and then the angle, the orientation, or the direction of thermal radiation. Um, hmm. We're going to have Planck's distribution. We're actually, it's expressed in an equation how the emission is a function of wavelength and temperature for a surface for a black surface, a perfect emitter. Then we'll get to the black body. Uh, we'll get the Stefan Boltzmann law. EB is equal to sigma T to the fourth. That comes from Planck's distribution. Basically saying over all the wavelengths, where predominantly the wavelengths are from 0.1 to 100, but they'll say over all the wavelength, la wavelength from zero to infinity, that covers 0 0.1 to 100 microns. Um, you can say then that uh, the total emission or emissive power or emissive flux from a black body is sigma t to the fourth. What was sigma again? Stefan Boltzmann constant. Stefan Boltzmann constant. And if you want, it's a 5.67 plus some other digits, but they're that's good to three significant digits, times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. All right. Um, what we'll do is we'll be interested in emission from the sun. And one of the things that's um, important is how the solar emission from the sun is absorbed on a typical surface here. So even though it's not emission, it's absorption, it's absorptivity. I think we were introduced to that concept in chapter one. We have the emission, emissivity, the absorptivity, or known by abs this alpha. It's uh, instead of emissivity. Okay, and uh, the t so the temperature of the sun is around 5,800 Kelvin. What is that? That's not the core temperature. It's an average surface temperature, um, which reflects the type of radiation and the distribution of the th uh, wavelength distribution radiation that's going out from the sun. Okay. And so uh, we'll be very much interested in how it's absorbed on a surface and then also how it's reflected off of the surface. If we're, we're interested in what we call opaque surfaces. What's an opaque surface? Uh, our surfaces will either, it'll be absorbed or reflected. That's pretty much it. When it comes down and hits our surface. Um, we, yes, in the textbook, but it handles transmission through surfaces, but that's like a glass. And for this class, the amount of time that we have devoted to thermal radiation, uh, we primarily work with opaque surfaces. Well, we're going to get down to this law. It takes us a long time to get there. There's a lot of territory to cover, which says there's a relationship between how well the surface emits, sends out photons, versus how well the surface absorbs photons. And this really is a startling result, Kirchhoff's law. And it says that at a particular wavelength, 
maybe at 3 microns or 0.3 microns, that the emission is equal to the absorption. Okay. Not only that, we're going to have two angles uh, with characterizing the directional characteristics. So wavelength characterizes the, uh, or lambda characterizes the wavelength, and then we'll typically have uh, theta and phi as two angles in a hemisphere above a surface, and that characterizes both the incident direction of the radiation as well as the emission in that same direction. And it's at that same direction, theta phi, theta phi, and at that same temperature. temperature. So there's a lot of subscripts on the full uh, Kirchhoff's law, but often we just boil it down and we say, oh, the, the emission is equal to the absorptivity. But we have to be very careful because often uh, we may think of the solar absorptivity. That's not what's in Kirchhoff's law. So you can have a surface exposed to the sun, and the sun can, it can preferentially absorb or have a higher absorptivity than emission. And maybe you've had some experience with that. And I'll talk about that in this class. Hopefully it's like, you know, your fingers sticking to ice cubes. Aha! See, something we learned in this class applies to the real life that uh, I've experienced. Or, or uh, dew point temperatures and other things. But anyway, have, maybe you've seen it where you lay something in the sun, and then if you try to pick it up, you can really get burnt. Your fingers, can, it's like super hot. And often what's happening is, is the solar absorptivity is higher than it's emission. First time you look at the Kirchhoff's law, you say, hey, they have to be the same. Ah, uh -uh. the surface of the temperature of the sun is 5,800 Kelvin, 5,800 Kelvin. Maybe that thing laying on the ground is hot, but it's not hotter than maybe boiling water. Let's say it's 400 Kelvin, you know. Well, okay, there's a big difference between 400 and 5,800 Kelvin. Okay. Well, then we're going to get ready to launch into the next chapter, and the next chapter deals with gray diffuse surfaces. So basically everything is for the hemisphere above a surface. It's like, what do you mean by hemisphere? Half of a sphere. It's everything on top of a surface. And uh, we'll, we'll have that. It, we have hemispherical properties, and then we have... Um, averaged over all the wavelengths. So a gray diffuse surface. Um, diffuse meaning also the directional characteristics are standard. Um, if I think of this being the normal direction, it is a cosine distribution for the emission. That's a bad looking cosine distribution, but if I have photons and it's being emitted, they're going to primarily come straight off the surface, and very few, but some, will come at shallow angles off of the surface. All right, I sure do wish I had more time for this topic right here. Why? Environmental radiation. What does that mean to you? Environmental radiation. Climate change. You're absolutely right, because why is the climate getting warmer, you know, the Earth's surface, blah, 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 all that. It's because of the inability to uh, transmit energy thermally through the atmosphere back out to, right, to, this, to the uh, abyss of whatever, the dark skies. <laughs> and it's because the layer um, tends to, of the surface of the Earth tends to allow stuff in easier, uh, then and not allow it out as rapidly or as, as it has in the past. Hence, it becomes more of a greenhouse. And there's gases, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. That's what it's doing in the atmosphere. So I wish wish I had more time, but SKIP, let's jump into it. Hopefully this review gives you a sense of where we're going. We're going to talk about the wavelength, and then we're going to talk about the direction. This is where the math gets a little beyond us, just to be honest, for the time we have. So the electromagnetic spectrum. So we sketch it out. Often they have a uh, 
diagram like this. They put down here uh, wavelength, and you can put it in a dump a bunch of different units, but in thermal radiation, we often use micron. You could use nanometers, etc. And uh, you can put in here something like uh, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the 0, 10 to the plus 1, 10 to the plus 2, 10 to the plus 3, and et cetera. You can keep going, 10 to the minus 2. And then you can think, oh, where's gamma rays? Oh, they're way down here. But they're part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Where are x-rays? Well, they're not as uh, low as the... Uh, gamma rays, but they're down in that vicinity. And then finally, for the visible spectrum, it's tucked in a very narrow range. Visible spectrum is between 0.4 and 0.7. That's the visible spectrum. If you have good eyes, you know, the average human eye can see pretty good in that visible spectrum. That's, that's what we see. All right. <clears throat> And then thermal radiation goes from, hey, I just messed that up. This is not in the right location, is it? This is one. i got to move that. Sorry. See if I can move it. Okay, almost moved it all. So the visible spectrum from 0.4 micron to 0.7 micron, roughly. All right. And then you have 0.1. This is a 0.1 micron. And so from 0.1 up to 100, that's 10 to the 2. That's 100 micron. You have thermal radiation. Okay. So what do we have that small wavelength that's you know, not in the visible spectrum? You would call that the ultraviolet, UV. Have you ever heard of UV? Sure. You ever buy glasses and they talk about the UV protection of your eyes? There it is. Why that's lower wavelength, higher energy, and um, higher damage to your eyes or damage to your skin, you can get skin burn. You get primarily skin burn from the UV. All right. And then out in here, you have the IR, the infrared. So the infrared radiation, often they'll talk about the longer wavelength infrared and then the shorter wavelength infrared or near field, far field infrared. But uh, so you have the UV, the visible and the IR. OK, some people may have remembered and a mnemonic. It's a Roy G. Biv. Yeah, Roy. I'm going to spell it backwards. G. B. I. V. And that stands for red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And so the red is around the 0.7, and the violet's around the 0.4. And what's smack dab in the middle of the visible spectrum? Green green. So, so, and then it helps you this way, red linked with the infrared, and the violet linked with the ultra violet, UV. So hopefully that ties it together. Okay, now there's a relationship between the speed of the electromagnetic spectrum and the wavelength And the frequency. Well, in this class and most thermal radiation, we don't emphasize the frequency as much. You could, but we emphasize the wavelength. And so what would be the speed? C. The wavelength? Lambda. The frequency? Maybe nu. What's the speed of light? In a vacuum? That would be the speed of electromagnetic radiation. And so the speed of the photons traveling at any of these wavelengths in a vacuum would be a, a roughly 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And then the energy of a photon is given by a, 
uh, Planck's constant, the speed divided by the lambda. So if Planck's constant's a constant, the speed of light's a constant, then you see that the energy is proportional to 1 over lambda. As lambda gets smaller, what does the energy of that packet, that photon, do? It goes up. UV is very dangerous, high energy, destroys your skin or damages your eyes or other things. Has anybody ever seen anybody that did too much fishing without UV protection on their eyes? Or do snow up in the mountains, do skiing in the, in the, um, in the winter, and, or mountain climbing, and they don't protect their eyes real good? Yeah, it looks a little weird, doesn't it, if you've ever seen that. So you have to protect your eyes. Well, that's a lot of what I wanted to cover. So let's continue on. So the electromagnetic spectrum, all these are my internal notes. Just you have to know all these things. Here's Planck's constant. It doesn't matter. You can look up Planck's constant. I don't have it memorized. Give me a break, right? You can't memorize everything. You only memorize things by frequently using them in engineering. So mnemonic, uh, Roy G. Biv. Um, here's interesting. Uh, Leo the lion goes grr. <laughs> I've never heard of that one. But uh, or oil rig. So oxidation is the loss of electrons. Reduction is the gain of electrons. Anyway, th there's a bunch of different things to help people remember things. Um, so that's what a mnemonic is. So what about a black body? Well, black body is a perfect surface for thermal radiation. <laughs> Let's take a look at three characteristics. It emits the maximum thermal radiation regardless of wavelength and direction. It, it, in that direction, at that wavelength, it's the maximum possible. Nothing emits better than that surface in that direction at that wavelength for the same temperature. You can't change temperatures. We know this. The temperature goes up, emission goes up dramatically for, for the same temperature. It is a diffuse emitter. So the intensity is uniform, and the radiation emissive flux is cosine distributed. I'm going to try and draw that again. Here's my surface. It's doing the emission to something above it, the gas or space above it. We often introduce a perpendicular N, normal direction. It would emit strongest straight up, and it would be a cosine distribution. So if this was the angle theta, introduced right here, then the intensity would be the cosine of theta. So if theta is equal to zero, cosine is one. If the theta is equal to pi over two, that would be emitting here at pi over two, 90 degrees. What is the cosine? Zero. So really, it goes to zero. So we try and draw that again where it's magnitude of one. And then as I'm going out, it's reducing. And, and then as I get finally in that direction, it tucks right in. So that's the way they show a cosine distribution. So a black body has that directional preference of emission. OK. The other thing about a black body that sometimes we forget because the focus is often on the emission, but it likes to absorb. So it absorbs all the incident radiation regardless of wavelength or direction. If a photon hits a black body, it's gobbled up. That's why they, I think they really call it black, because if you look at an object that's red, what's it doing? It's reflecting red. If you look at an object that's black, it's not reflecting much. It's not in the visible spectrum and so basically it's gobbling up absorbing all those photons so we want to talk about Planck's distribution and then we want to talk about Wien's displacement law well here is some notation e lambda comma b all right let's do the first thing subscript b what's the subscript b for it's a for black body okay what about lambda? It's going to be per wavelength. So that wavelength of interest will be between 0.1 and 100 micron. But you could say that lambda goes between 0 and infinity. All right, covers everything. 
So E, what is cap E for? Emissive power or emissive flux? The book uses emissive power a lot, yet the units on this term will be something like watts per meter squared micron. I understand the micron, it's, it's per the wavelength of interest in that zone around that particular micron wavelength. But when you put the uh, watts per meter squared, I'm thinking of flux instead of a power. Power is just watts, but I'm going to be consistent with the book. And so this would be the units on this term. Watts per meter squared micron. It is, uh, the, sometimes I'll call it monochromatic black body or black surface, emissive power or emissive flux. Sometimes they'll even say it's the spectral instead of monochromatic, meaning it's, it's a function of the wavelength. It's the spectral emissive power, the spectral emissive flux. Sometimes students get um, confused because there's not just one notation in all textbooks for what you're talking about. So they'll have the E lambda B, and they'll plot it as a function of wavelength in micron. So if you have something that's relatively cold, it will put out a distribution like this. And if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, maybe we're very much interested in point 0.1, then we have this 1, and way down here, it's 0.4 to 0.7. That's our visible spectrum. There's no significant emission in the visible spectrum for something that's room temperature. Hence, if we turn out all the lights in this room, what do your eyes see? Nothing. But if I had a hot stove up here, and the stove was turned on, and the coil, of electric coil on that hot stove was sitting there fully going 100%, right? And I turned off all the lights in this room. What would you see? You would see the red, hot, glowing coil on the stove. So after the surface heats up, you can get significant emission in the visible spectrum. So this would be a low temperature. And then as it heats up, it's higher temperature higher temperature, even up till you get to essentially the temperature of the sun where it kind of peaks right up in here, and it peaks right at uh, green. So this will be like 5,800 Kelvin. And it's dumping a lot in the, in the visible spectrum. Now, the x-axis has wavelength, and so you want it to go from 0.1 to 1, to 10, to 100, right? Actually, I should have stretched it out more because um, I'll show a real plot of this, but I'm just, for illustration purposes, 100 should be further out. Sorry about that. Put 10 here and then put 100 out there. Okay, so something really cold, maybe it's emitting in the long wavelength, maybe something that's 100 Kelvin. Is that cold? Yeah. 100 Kelvin is really cold. Maybe 300 Kelvins here. It's really not emitting significantly or anything in the visible spectrum. Maybe you get higher temperature and then finally up to the temperature of the sun and you're emitting strongly. Okay, what about this X, not X axis? We talked about that. What about the Y axis? Well, that's my spectral emissive power, units of watts per meter squared per micron wavelength. Okay. Well, they have to tuck a lot of information on this because the surface of the sun is really shooting out at very high intensity. And so it's staggering in engineering how many orders of uh, magnitude there are on the y-axis when you're putting something like uh, Planck's distribution, talk about spectral emissive power. All right, well, let me do this. Let me give you the equation for E sub lambda B. It's a constant C1 divided by lambda to the fifth power multiplied by the exponential of another constant C2 divided by lambda T minus one. 
Okay, so the constants don't frighten us. There's a C1 and a C2, and their values are given in the textbook. I don't need to repeat them here. But this function, whoever came up with it, Planck, was a genius. How did they figure this out? How does that plot, how does that function give us the y as a function of lambda, lambda shows up there and there, for different t's? You put in maybe 100, plot it as a function of lambda. Put in maybe 300, plot it as a function of lambda. Put in 5,800, plot it as a function of lambda. And when you put in the 5,800, the magnitude is very, very high of this monochromatic emissive power flux or spectral emissive power. So it's a very simple equation, isn't it? At least it looks simple. Well, here it is plotted to scale. So again, it stops at 100, stops at 0.1, there's a wavelength. What's the shaded region in here? They put 0.4 to 0.6, but it's like 0.4 to 0.7, somewhere like that. And uh, why do they shade this? That's the visible spectrum, what your eye, typical good eye can see. All right. Now, look at this spectral emissive power. Again, what are the units? Watts per meter squared micron. And just look at this. So you go from 0.1 to 1, 1 to 10, 10 to 100. That's three orders of magnitude. Here, but 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 1. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 orders of magnitude. So at this point, I hope that you appreciate this is very unique. Uh, go to a solids class textbook or even thermodynamics textbook or dynamics or statics textbook. And what, what varies reasonably 12 orders of magnitude? Not much. I know some people say, oh, what about the size uh, measurement of certain diameters, like from a grain of sand to the planet Pluto or something? Okay, well, fine. You just keep playing that game. But for engineering, you don't see in mechanical engineering curriculum something that actually varies that much. You may see something that varies five orders of magnitude. Like, take a look. What's the x-axis on the Moody diagram? That's not 12. <laughs> it's, it's a lot, but it's not 12. Okay, so here are those constants. And uh, they plot this right here, this dashed line. What do you think that dashed line is connecting it's connecting for different red lines at different temperatures. This is 5,800 Kelvin. What's this one? 800 Kelvin, 300 Kelvin. It's connecting the peaks, the peaks. And so this is Wien's displacement law. So Wien's displacement law. How do you think the Calculus One student derived Wien's displacement law? You got a function. Differentiate set equal to zero because that's where the slope of this function and determine what is the x value that gives it. So wouldn't this be neat? You take this function. What am I differentiating with respect to? Lambda. <laughs> and then I set that equal to zero and then I solve for the lambda that gives me, it you know, solves that equation. And what happens is it just boils down to lambda max times temperature is equal to a constant. That constant just works out to be the 2898 um, micron Kelvin. So if somebody said room temperature 300, where is the majority of thermal radiation occurring in this room? Well, you could come out and you'd say, well, this is 300. I'm sorry, this temperature is 300. So I would divide maybe 3,000, approximate it by 300. What's that close to? 10 micron. Come out here, I know it's a little less than 10 micron, but isn't that the maximum for something that's 300 room temperature? 
So inside this room, it's about 300 Kelvin. There's a lot of photons flowing around that have wavelength of a little less than 10 micron. What's the range at which it would e emit and ex do the exchange back and forth? Well, what I would do is I'd come over here and say, um, I don't have to drop ch change much on the y-axis to to start to fall off the cliff. You know, it's so this if I drop this much right here, that's about a order of magnitude. So if I come down and I cut and I cut, um, just trying to draw it out, so it'd be around 10, and it would be from 4 to 40. So thermal radiation in this room is 4 to 40 microns with a peak of around 10 microns. A little less than 10, but you know what I'm doing. Somebody says, what about the solar radiation? Well, let's come up here. Where's the peak? I know it's not smack dab in the middle, but around 0.5-ish micron. What's the range? Well, I'd come down, I'd fall about a magnitude or so, and it would be from 0.2 to 2. 0.2 to 2. A lot of radiation is happening in there, maybe 90%, 95%. There's some in the tails. And it's not equally distributed. It's just a rough approximation. So... That hopefully you can look at a plot like this and not just quickly turn the page, but gain something off of it because there's a lot of information on the plot. All right, well, I tried to cover all this. Okay, so if you heat something up like a metal, heat it up high enough, it can start to glow. So around 500 degrees C, you get a red glow. But Every now and then, a student in this class, and I'm curious if anybody in this room has seen hot white, where if you continue to heat it up, beyond the red, it'll go white like the sun. Now, I think you have to have protection on your eyes. It's like a welder, right? It's to protect their eyes with the, uh, the mask because it's so intense. But you see white. That's what it is. It's not red anymore, is it? So, yeah, you can get uh, white-hot metals as well as white-hot, like, in, in welding. Anybody a welder? One, two, -ish, three, four. Yeah, I, I got the auto tint when they first came out, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, maybe more. And yet now I don't think that's as good because they say it will not react fast enough and you'll zap your eyes. So do you use the you stay away from the auto tint? Yeah. Manual flip down and continuous protection. Yeah. Anyway, I was just curious because I've got both. It's just, I don't do that much welding. Protect your eyes, right? All right. Well, you want to get to the Stefan Boltzmann law. We have the Planck's distribution. Aren't you glad that you took calculus? Because all you have to do is say, I don't want it for in the individual wavelength. I want it for all of the wavelengths. So what's this doing, this integration from zero to infinity over all the wavelengths? It's summing them all up, summing up the contribution. And there's three dots here. What does that mean? It's a lot of work or a little bit of work. Uh, I can outline it to you when you put that in the integral. You have the C1, you have this D lambda, and what you want to do is you want to change variable because of this lambda T right there. So what you want to do is you want to put your lambda to the fifth, let me write it all out, EXP of C2 divided by lambda T minus 1. Uh, whoops, I got that wrong. This way. Okay, so you multiply by T and T. That way I change variable, and maybe I let x be lambda t. But then I don't have enough t's down there, so I'll put another four t's down there, and then I have to put a four t up there. And so then I have the integral dx still going from zero to infinity because I just scaled by t. It's still zero to infinity. And I'll have that c1 divided by x to the fifth 
exp c2 over x minus 1. Ah. Minus 1 dx. And then you had that t to the fourth already starting to show. Hey, I wanted that temperature to the fourth. All right, so basically all of that inside the integral now, where that integral is sigma. Sigma is uh, it's the Stefan Boltzmann constant. It's related to C1 and C2. So just to show that you can use a tool, uh, I set it up. Here it is for that just that integral. You get the pi over 4, 15, C to the 4. So this is what sigma's got to be. Substitute what C1 is. Substitute the pi to 4, fine. The 15, and then you had C2 to the 4th power. <laughs> and yes, you get that. So, okay, a lot of work. We showed it. Planck's distribution gets to the um, uh, Stefan-Boltzmann law. Well, we're interested sometimes in how much emission doesn't go between zero and infinity, but between zero and lambda. And so we're interested in bands of emission. Because if I could figure out maybe it goes from zero to two micron, then I could use that result and I could go from zero to four micron. Then if I wanted to know the difference, what goes between two and four micron, then I would take the sub take this one and subtract that one and then I would have the percent or the fraction. So they have this cap F. Now in a minute you're going to be introduced to view factor. Not today, maybe tomorrow. We'll be not Wednesday we'll get into view factors. But this F is for fraction, not view factor in the future. Okay. And so its subscript is zero to lambda. So what is the fraction of emission? between 0 to a lambda, and it's a function of temperature. So here it is. You just do that. Divide it by the, the total emission. Substitute, and there you go. You can make that calculation. Well, aren't you glad that other people have done that calculation for you and put it in this table in our textbook? So what they found is a function of sigma times t, not sigma, lambda times t, which is in micron Kelvin. So if you want to know the fraction going up to that wavelength at whatever temperature it is, first you have to figure out what wavelength you're in. Oh, I'm interested in two microns. What temperature? I don't know, 300 Kelvin. Do the product. That's going to be 600 micron Kelvin. Come down, find 600, and then read off that fraction. Essentially nothing. Essentially nothing. But let's say I was uh, 20, 20 micron, 300 Kelvin. That would be 6,000, wouldn't it? Well, I have to come look for 6,000. It looks like it's close to that one. I, I don't know if my table, did I truncate it? Okay, there it is. And this is the fraction right here, 74%. So these... This table uh, allows you to do band calculations. How much is emitted in this uh, wavelength band? Okay. Okay, so we do have em emissivity for real surfaces. One is we're data starved. It's like, hey, we have the computational power in computers, and we have all this theory, which is beautiful, but often in engineering, we're starved for data. Like, do I really know? Do I really know the emissivity at all these wavelengths? Because if I knew the emissivity at all these wavelengths, then I'd multiply by that spectral emissive power to get the actual emissive power at that wavelength for that temperature of the surface. Um, what you can see is um, the real surface emission at a given temperature is different than the black body emission at a particular temperature. Often the, the black body is nice and smooth and the real surface is not. And so it varies a lot. If Again, if I looked at it at any particular wavelength, I pick one, it's the ratio of that line 
over that line, that gives me the emissivity at that wavelength. I come over here, maybe the emissivity at this wavelength is a little higher. You know, it's emissivity is a function of lambda. Okay. Um, here is my emissivity as a function of lambda. It's uh, plotted on the x-axis, so from 0 to 2 micron, it was an uh, emissivity of 0.35. And then above, it was 0.2, and then it's 0, above 4 micron. Can you approximate uh, for a surface that's 2,000 Kelvin, what is the total hemispherical emissivity? Hemispherical just means there's no directional preference. It's just there's no nothing in here about direction, just into the hemisphere above. And you're going to be able to compute that it's around 0.243. How do you make that calculation? Well, you bust it in the bands. You go from 0 to 2, then from 2 to 4, and then from 4 to infinity. Isn't that the same as going 0 to infinity for an integration? And what we want is we want to calculate the emissivity. And it's, it's based on, let me try this. Um, do this. The integral divide by sigma t to the fourth from 0 to infinity of the E um, lambda B um, or put a D right here. You're summing up all over the emission at that wavelength for that, that uh, black body. Okay, you compare it to the total emission, which was over all the wavelengths. Maybe I'll put here uh, d lambda because I'm integrating from zero to lambda, zero to infinity. And this would be then the emissivity um, for the total. It's not at a particular wavelength. Maybe I should go back here. This slide right here, this one. d lambda integrate, integrate emission lambda b d lambda from 0 to infinity, 0 to infinity, that would give us the total hemispherical emissivity. All right, so I need to bust this in the bands and then normalize by sigma t to the fourth. So I need to find out what is the fraction that's going between 0 and 2 and the fraction going between 2 and 4, and then the fraction between 4 and affinity. And here I multiply by the emissivity between 0 and 2, the emissivity between 2 and 4, the emissivity between 4 and affinity. Add them up. This sigma t to the fourth, sigma t to the fourth, they're going to cancel. And that's how you calculate the emissivity, the total hemispherical emissivity. So what it boils down to is what is that fraction between 0 and 2 micron? Well, the surface is 2,000, so I have to calculate 2 micron times 2,000 Kelvin. What does that give me? 4,000 micron Kelvin. I go to my table. I try to find 4,000 right here. What is that fraction? 0. 0.4809. How about that? So, so this fraction is 0. 0.4809. All right. What about now uh, the fraction going from uh, 0 to 4 and then I subtract off what went from 0 to 2. So if I do uh, 4 micron times 2,000 Kelvin, that gives me the uh, 8,000 micron Kelvin. Let's go back to our table, find 8,000. What is that number? 
0.8563. I mean, you can keep more digits, 0 0.8563. So it's 0 0.8563. Subtract 0 0.49, uh, 4, 4, 0.4809. And that gives me the fraction between 2 and 4. And then this one is 1 minus 0.8563. So I only had to go to the table twice. Look, sent, look reasonable? So we multiply. This is, uh, well, I think it's 0 0.35. And then this one, 0 0.2. And then this one is 0. So I really, well, I didn't even need to calculate that last fraction. And so how about this? Somebody want to run that number? 0.35 times 0 0.4809 plus 0.2 times 0 0.8563 minus 0 0.4809. Do you get around 0 0.24? Okay, so we got two agreements. Thank you so much. Now, the last part, part B, total emissive power. This is where I would rather have emissive flux, but that's the way the book words it. Look at the answer. It's in watts per meter squared or kilowatts per meter squared. So per meter squared of the surface area, what's the emissive power coming off? All right. How would you calculate that? How about I pause, walk around? All right, so to get the total emissive power, it would be like E is equal to the, the emissivity that you calculated, that total emissivity. I know the hemispherical may throw you off, but a total emissivity times uh, EB, which is simply the emissivity you calculated, Stefan Boltzmann, temperature to the fourth power. Look good. And then I know we don't want to avoid the integration. Some people are thinking I need to go do the integration over all wavelengths, but we already did that. Okay. All right. So real surfaces basically can have a transmissivity, but we're going to deal with opaque surfaces where the transmissivity is zero. What's the transmissivity? It's how much, what's the fraction transmitted? compared to the total incoming. So if we have the total coming in, some of it's going to be absorbed, some of it's going to be reflected, some of it's going to be transmitted. And so if the, uh, the sum of them has to sum up to 100%. But often that's zero. And what we get is that the reflectivity plus the absorptivity is equal to 100%. All right. Okay. If you're given something like this, what's on the y-axis? Is that emissivity? No, it's absorptivity as a function of wavelength. So they're coming out to 0.3 micron, then the 1.5 micron, and then out to infinity. So from 0 to 0.3, the absorptivity is 0. Then it jumps up to 0.9. That's quite high absorptivity in this range between 3 and 1 micron, or 1.5 micron, and then beyond, it's 0.1. Okay, so this is another good calculation to make. What's the, the, determine the solar absorptivity. When you see this word solar, what does that mean? It's coming from the sun. Temperature of the sun, surface, 5,800 Kelvin. That's a good engineering number to use. So if it's emitting at 5,800 Kelvin, that's the type of wavelength of photons. What can you tell me about the photons? There are a lot in the visible spectrum, some in the UV and some in the near field IR or short wavelength IR. Okay, what did we say? We said that the wavelength was around 0.2 to 2 Micron, wasn't it? Approximate? A lot of radiation from the sun. 
If you take a look at from the sun, maybe right out here is 2. Point 2 is right here. See what you're doing? You're going to get that solar, that absorptivity of the surface from the solar incoming radiation is going to be high. Okay? You're going to numerically calculate it 77%. That's pretty high. How do you calculate this? Well, you have to get what is the uh, the fraction. It's a sum of these times their fractions. It's so basically we have three bands: band one, band two, band three. So it's going to be absorptivity times that fraction of the incoming that's in the range from. 0 to 0 0.3 micron, then the absorptivity times the fraction of the incoming, that's from 0.3 to 1.5 micron, and then the absorptivity of the surface times the fraction of the radiation coming from 1.5 to infinity. Does that make sense? All right. So we already know what this is. That's 0. This one is 0.9. This one is 0.1. So I really need to get the fraction. So the way you get the fractions is you need to calculate the fraction that is 0 to 0.3, the fraction 0 to 1.5. Those are the only two numbers you need. This one is used right there. And then you make the calculation, the fraction from 0.3 to 1.5 is equal to the fraction that goes 0 to 1.5, subtract the fraction 0 to 0.3. And then you make the calculation, the fraction 1.5 to infinity is equal to 1 minus the fraction from 0 to 1.5. All right, let's do this. How about I make I let you calculate one of these. Um, let's do this one right here. Can you tell me for the surface of the sun, effective temperature 5800 Kelvin, what is the fraction of emission between 0 and 1.5 micron? Can you make that calculation? You probably need your book, but I want to see if you can make that calculation. It went in. All right, everybody's in. Let's go ahead and stop this and take a look. Oh, wow, we're at the little work here grading. So it's around 0 0.8808070 something. 0 0.8808. This one will take 0 0.844, 0 0.8815. I'll call it close. 0 0.8807. Okay, 0.8819, really? I put a, I graded a 1.5 correctly. Yeah, okay. Some of these others, what's well, about 0.9? Too much rounding off. Okay. Okay, so that's the, you, you make these calculations, you calculate that the, the solar emissivity exists. Now, if the surface is, if another surface that's at 350 is bombarding it, then what's its absorptivity, alpha, for that 350 surface? Well, 350, what's the, from Wien's displacement, it's, it's far out there. It, and so it's going to have a emissivity, I mean, absorptivity close to 0.1. So think about this. Later, we're going to have Kirchhoff's law that the, for the same temperature, the absorptivity is equal to the emissivity. So, but if the sun is right here, it has very short wavelength photons, and we often have the solar absorptivity. And if this is very high, 0.74 or 774, and its emissivity is just 0.1, 
and it's radiating back and forth with the surroundings that may be around 350 Kelvin, what's going to happen is, is that surface exposed to sunlight will get very hot, a lot hotter than a surface who has uh, solar absorptivity closer to the nominal emissivity or the so absorptivity associated with the surrounding material. So uh, what happens is if I have a different surface that is the, the spectral absorptivity is pretty flat, maybe it's, it's all you know, 0.1 or all 0.9, then it will be emitting just as well as it's absorbing from the sun. But if it's like this, high absorptivity in the spectrum where the so solar radiation is incoming, it will be significantly higher temperature. All right, let's press on. Let's take a look at some tables in the back of the book, table A11. It's a long table. It goes over multiple pages. But if you wanted to know, this is a hemispherical, hemispherical emissivity for, I don't know, highly polished aluminum film. It's a function of temperature. And there you go. There's some values. Okay. If it was bright foil, there's some different values. So the table is very long, has a bunch of different materials in it. Here are uh, things like asphalt pavement. Well, the emissivity is around 0 0.9, 0 0.85 to 0 0.93 for this temperature. Um, here's sand. Sand, I know different sands at different beaches have different characteristics, but 0.9. How about skin, your surface, your skin, 0.95? These are for hemispherical, hemispherical. Okay. This one is the last part. This table A12 is very interesting because what do they give you right here? Alpha subscript S. What's its absorptivity when exposed to solar radiation? And then they also give you this emissivity, like a hemispherical emissivity. And then what do they give you in this column? A ratio of how well it absorbs the solar radiation compared to how well it's going to basically emit. And often those are much different temperatures. Okay, a lot lower temperature for emission. But if when you have a number that's high, be very careful laying it in the sun and then going up and touching it. It'll be a lot hotter because it'll need to do an energy balance. And the temperature of the sun is always 5,800 Kelvin. It's this temperature down here that has to get high enough if it's insulated in the back and there's negligible air convection, it's a very still day, that basically it has to radiate out, radiative exchange with the surroundings. So this temperature here can get quite high. Temperature of the surface will be higher when you have something like that who served in the army, who's been over in the, you know, middle of Iraq or different countries and know this by experience. Have you? Yeah, I've often have had students who were in the military and they've learned it by being overseas, close to the equator. I mean, we're, we're hot, but we're not close to the equator where the sun's really brutal and it's cloudless skies. <laughs> And the sky, uh, anyway, it, you, but I have experience, too, of leaving some aluminum polished tools or other things laying out, and then I need to touch it, pick it up like a wrench, and it's like, ow. Seat belts, even? That's your exposure? That's your experience? Yeah. But, well, anyway, take a look. It's, it's, this is information that uh, you can use in your, in your life. So now what we want to do is uh, take a look at uh, the fluxes associated with an opaque surface. So here's my surface. Now, to maintain a constant temperature, I may have to supply from the back side, the non-radiative participating side of the surface, a flux. And so I'm going to show that as being supplied to the small control volume 
right there. There's my control volume. Okay, so this may be a conductive flux. Okay, now what do we have is we have irradiation coming in, photons. Often they draw it over to the side coming down here. And that's our G. Now, the G in the book does not use G double prime, but the units on this G, this irradiation, are watts per meter squared. What are the watts on Q double prime? Watts per meter squared. Well, if they don't put the double prime on the G, why don't they take it off the Q? Sorry. Well, why don't they put a G double prime? Sorry. Just what it is in engineering and literature, and sometimes if you look too hard and think too long, you'll be like, isn't this a little contradictory? Yeah. But they don't use G double prime but it is a flux, uh, uh, an irradiation of watts per meter squared. Okay, what happens to some of the photons that are incoming? Well, you can get some rho times g. What is rho? What is the name of rho? Reflectivity. It's 0 to 100%. Uh, we, uh, for an opaque surface, the reflectivity plus the absorptivity is equal to 100%. No transmissivity. All right. Now, what happens to the 1 minus rho times g? Well, I'm going to show it like that. 1 minus rho times g. It's alpha g. Isn't alpha equal to 1 minus rho? So what happens? Maybe... 30% reflected, if rho is 30%, 70% is absorbed. All right? But this surface is at a temperature it wants to emit. So it's emitting, and so you have the emissivity times EB. Isn't that the strength of the emission? It's not a black body. It has some emissivity. So we multiply that times the black body emissive flux or power, and that's our outgoing. Now, the sum of the reflected and emitted is the J. What? Don't I know? You're getting confused, but this helps us in the bookkeeping. J is our radiosity. It's not J double prime. It's just J, and it's the net outgoing. It's the sum of the reflected and the emitted. So this illustration, hopefully you can um, digest it a little bit. But if we have our control volume, we have our uh, in is equal to our outs. That's all energy balance is. Let's do it per unit area of the surface. So we'll be looking at fluxes. What's an in from the bottom? Q double prime. What's an in from the top? Depending how big of a control volume you do, um, you could put the in as a, uh, uh, let's put it like this, 1 minus rho times g, but then the only out is an emissivity times eb. That's for a very thin control volume thin control volume, or if you had a little thicker control volume, out like this, whoops, I'm not drawing it that well, if it was a little larger, you'll get the same result, let me draw it over here, a larger control volume, you still have the in equal to the out, what's our in, our Q double prime from the bottom, the 100% of G from the top, and then our out is our radiosity, J, which is the sum of the rho G plus emissivity EB. And can you see that when I bring this over to that side and combine it, I get the same equation? They're the same equations. But at least what we have is we've introduced you to these radiative fluxes. The G is incoming. It's our irradiation. 
or J is the net outgoing radiosity made of two components, made of reflected and emitted. We're going to revisit that in the next chapter. Kirchhoff's Law. Well, we can do Kirchhoff's Law for a little flat surface in an enclosure. You can do Kirchhoff's Law for one side of a large parallel surface and another side of a large parallel surface. You can do Kirchhoff's Law for an object, doesn't have to be circular, can be circular, in a large enclosure. I've seen all of these. You see what I'm doing? And so, But you're interested in the exchange from this surface and that surface, this surface and that surface, this surface and that surface. I think it's a little easier to do two infinitely large parallel plates, but I think most books do something like this. Okay, what's the bottom line for Kirchhoff's Law? Well, something about the absorptivity and the emissivity. The surface, the two surfaces are, have to be the same temperature. We're not interested in different temperatures and comparing different cases. It's the same temperature, the same orientation, theta and phi. I know I haven't really emphasized theta and phi, but that gives us the direction of the uh, radiation, incoming as well as outgoing, and at the same wavelength. The most important to remember is the same wavelength. And often all you have to do is change it up and have, oh, we're going to have solar irradiation. And that can significantly be different than the nominal uh, emissivity of a surface. All right. Okay, so let's do the uh, derivation. If I consider two large parallel black plates, uh, I have the temperature one and the temperature two. What leaves one is simply no reflection, it's just the emission of one. That is 100% G. Hey, what was that? Irradiation on two. From the perspective of surface two over here, what's hitting G2 is, is what's hitting it is EB1. Likewise, What's being emitted from 2 is going and impinging itself on 1. All right. So what we find is that G1 is equal to EB1 from an energy balance statement. You can't have them the same temperature and yet a net radiative exchange between the two. This is the net. It's EB1 minus G1. You conclude G1 is equal to EB2. Uh, you put in uh, that EB1 and EB2, uh, you get that the sigma t to the fourth, and basically you conclude what you didn't even need a proof of is that they're at the same temperature for the net exchange to be zero. All right, redo it. Say if surface one, this surface, has an emissivity as well as an absorptivity for surface one. But we're going to leave the two temperatures the same. If you do that calculation, the net exchange concludes that the emissivity is equal to the absorptivity for the same surface, surface 1. If you back up a little bit and now consider at each and every wavelength, and then you can even back up further and do at each and every direction, so I'm not only interested in this wavelength, but I'm interested maybe for this surface, this direction, theta, and phi. It's really hard to show in 2D, but it's that circular uh, angle that goes around. You find if you have them at the same temperature, even if one is black, the emissivity and absorptivity for this surface is what we're trying to focus on. <clears throat> The net radiative exchange has to be zero if they're the same temperature. Then you get that uh, 
the bottom line is that the monochromatic or the spectral emissivity is equal to the spectral uh, absorptivity. At each wavelength, they're the same. And then again, you just do it for any direction. So that's the general Kirchhoff's law. And we use it in thermal radiation. All right. Now, this is the part where I don't know if I should uh, jettison a whole lot of it or just cover it like I'm going to cover it. But I have to focus on the directional characteristics of thermal radiation. And that will help us understand radiation intensity, which is a very abstract concept to students because it has very funny units. But to do the directional characteristics, I need to go back and review a radian. Because when you go to 3D, you don't have radians. You have stair radians. You don't have two-dimensional planar angles. You have three-dimensional solid angles. All right. So if we go back and review in 2D, put just the axis like this, and I have the length L of this line, and I sweep that length by pivoting or rotating around that point at the origin, so the length of the line doesn't change, it's just R, and I rotate it or sweep it through this angle theta. I then take a look at this. What is that? The length of the arc swept by the other tip. And there, there's a relationship between L, R, and theta. What's that relationship? Well, theta is the angle measured in radians, and it's a ratio of the length of the arc swept divided by the radius of the line, the constant length line. And it's measured in radians. Somebody says, what are the units of radians? Meters per second? What is that? Well, it's length meter divided by ra the radius length meter. It is dimensionless. Okay. So a little review. If I have this swept right here, so it's going from here to there, that angle theta is pi over to radian. True. If I then sweep from here all the way to there, what is theta? Pi radian, isn't it? Pi radian. Okay, now you're ready for the solid angle. Unfortunately, i got to draw 3D. <laughs> all right, I come out with a solid R, a same R. I'm not changing R. But instead of just kind of moving it in one direction, I'm moving it in two directions, two angular directions. And when I move it around two angular directions, I make a little cone. So now I'm not interested in the length of the cone. I'm interested in the area of the end. That's not a flat area, is it? It has a little concavity to it. Because if I... Um, let the angles change a lot, then I'm going to get a larger cone and it'll be more dramatic. And if I do the whole hemisphere or the whole sphere, you get the different numbers. But anyway, guess what omega is? It's our analogy to theta. So instead of a, a planar angle, it's a solid angle. And it's a ratio of not length to radius, area. That's exactly right. And not to radius, because I want this to be dimensionless. I'm going to do something to that radius. Square it. So the, the surface area divided by the R squared. That will be meters squared per meter squared. It's still dimensionless. Okay. Then you think to yourself, okay, let's take a look at this. And I'm going to let it sweep over the whole half of a sphere. So now it makes you think back, what is the meaning of a half of a length of a sphere? Uh, first of all, what's the area of a whole sphere? It's uh, either 
4 thirds pi r cubed or 4 pi r squared, answer A for clicker or answer B for clicker. Then just going to go back to multiple choice in there. So is the area 4 thirds pi r cubed or 4 pi r squared? All right, let's go ahead and stop. Now, here's a little hint, Zachary, right? The little hint. If I say area should have units of meter cubed or area should have units of meters squared, what should be the units on area? Answer A or B. Zachary just called it out to help you if you listen very carelessly. But answer A or B. Another clicker question. Area should have units meter cubed or area should have units meter squared? All right. So we're going to grade that one for sure, just to know that you're on the right track. And then what we do is we focus over here and we say, I have the radius cubed or I have the radius squared in my equation. And radius is length. One of them will give me area, either A, radius cubed, or B, radius squared, will give me the right units for area. Which one is it? I'm employing the Socratic method, which means if uh, you don't like the answer they gave because it's incorrect, you just change and ask a different question. And you just continue to ask questions until it's like they're on board. That's the Socratic method. I should, you should try it with your children when you have children. Because nothing else will work and probably that won't work either. All right, I think we're done. And now this better be 100%. Oh, come on now. No, no, come on now. Why do we have that? Because I was trying to get 100% because this one, it's 4 pi r squared. You don't have to memorize. Look at the units. It'll help you. To, oh, yeah, that's right. 4 pi, 4 thirds pi r cubed is a volume, not the area. Okay. So anyway, now if I say what is the area for a half a sphere, a hemisphere, half, hemi, hemi, half, half, hemi, Guess what the area becomes? It becomes not 4 pi r squared, 2 pi r squared. I divide by r squared, r squared's cancel. What is the solid angle in a hemisphere? It's 2 pi stair radian. Okay. So, so that's all my notes to myself. Now, you go back and you review the... Um, Spherical coordinate system, one that you were introduced to in physics or math or a long time ago. And then you really want to calculate the area, but you're going to integrate the area maybe with theta and phi, two angles, leaving the radius constant. You go back to polar coordinate system, we'll introduce x and y and z, and then you have a choice. Well, I'm going to come out with this straight line, that length of that line will be r, no problem, everybody agrees. But sometimes from the x-axis, they'll come out, they'll drop down this perpendicular in the x-y plane, and they'll come out, sweep out this, we'll call phi. In this book, in this heat transfer book, it's called phi. Guess what? I learned it as theta in my math class. So right away, you got to be careful. Because if you look at an equation in this book and compare it to an equation in a calculus book or another book, they may look different. Well, what is theta and what is phi? Now, we are very much interested in z being the normal to a surface sitting in the xy plane. Hence, we like to, our predominant angle to be theta. So I think that's why in the heat transfer book, up here, theta is with respect to the perpendicular out of the xy plane. So anyway, I just point that out. So you get this little 
arc length r sine theta d phi d r d hold it yeah r d is the other arc length and so that gives you your little area and then you can do integration now the world gets a little more challenging because they want to talk about the intensity the radiation intensity i okay so the radiation intensity is not per meter squared it's per meter squared n i know that's my no my notation they'll just put m squared and they'll say this is per area that's projected normal it's from the perspective of this person up here looking that way back and so if they look back your area could be this much but because they're not looking straight down if they look straight down one to one but if they're looking at a side they're just seeing it tilted they're seeing less of the area so it's a uh, intensity what happens then is you can get the flux as a intensity will be constant per angle shallow angles but when you convert it back to our uh, emission it'll be cosine distributed all right i'm just going to press on but you could have the same thing you can have uh, you can go back and talk about emission irradiation or radiosity in terms of this radiation intensity oh too much but i'm trying to make the comparison of the figure 12 2 where they're showing the intensity is uniform and 12.4 the figures look very different but it's the cosine distribution on the emission okay both are your standard cases they're the same all right oh boy I boy. oh man I don't know about this it's I have to jettison some material so the spectral emissive intensity is uniform but the emissive flux is cosine distributed they have the same units apparently it's watts per meter squared micron stair radian sr for stair radian watts per meter squared micron stair radian but then one of the meters squared is projected that's with the intensity and the other is with an actual meter squared <sighs> okay um okay i'm gonna skip that one too all right oh boy oh boy that's a long problem i think we can handle this problem consider the directional selective surface leaving the uh, having the directional emissivity east epsilon sub theta so it's a function of the angle not two angles just theta the theta is from the perpendicular going you know out the normal direction okay so theta is going to come down to 45 degrees and it'll have this emissivity of 0.8 and then somehow it magically changes this mathematical to see if the concept works it out you can work the math this way changes to 0.3 see what they're doing so it has a stronger directional emissivity straight up and and even at a shallow angle or a large theta beyond 45 it drops at the point three okay all right assuming that the surface is isotropic in the phi direction going around don't worry about the second angle calculate the ratio of the normal emissivity epsilon n to the hemispherical emissivity so first of all i need to calculate the normal emissivity and then I need to calculate the hemispherical emissivity. Then I calculate the ratio of the normal divided by the hemispherical. One of these three, either A, B, or C, is very easy. You can do it by just reading the problem and saying, oh, they're saying, you know, the length of the pencil is six inches. How long is the pencil? Six inches. I mean, it, so which one of these is really easy? The first one. So what is the answer for the first one? What is that normal emissivity? It's 0.8. 
But now I need to get the hemispherical. That is averaged over the entire hemisphere. Okay? So how do I calculate that average over the entire hemisphere? I'm going to be integrating, right? So um, this integration, I think I have it on the next page. And then that's the hard part. You're going to have to integrate. Uh, you'll have to integrate over the steradians, you know, integrate th th theta and phi. Um, the phi is the easy one. It goes between 0 and 2 pi. The theta, you're going to bust it between 0 and 45 degrees. I want that in, you know, I don't want it in degrees. What is that in pi over 2? And then, then I'm going to do theta from pi over 2 to pi. That will cover the whole hemisphere. And um, let me do this, jump over here. So we're going to integrate uh, with respect to, well, you bust it into two sections as well. You bust it into the integral from 0, hold it, did I say pi over 2 or pi over 4? pi over 4 to pi over 2. Sorry, I messed that up too. All right? So I go from 0 to pi over 4 and then pi over 4 to pi over 2 where I'm changing that from point 8 to point 2. What do we get over here? Well, we have the cosine of the sine of d theta and then the 2 pi is what came out uh, um, integrating over all the d phi. You integrate d phi 0 to 2 pi, you just get the 2 pi. All right. There's a relationship where the intensity and the emiss emission uh, cancel. Pi times intensity, emiss emissive intensity is equal to the emissivity. That's a relationship I skipped over developing. And uh, you then calculate the hemispherical emissivity. You then do the ratio, 0.8 to 0.55, and you find it's a 1.5, 1.45. I think this is a homework problem. You already looked at them? Did you already solve it? You just looked at them. That's good. Sometimes I'm able to solve a homework problem in class, and then that helps you if you're already familiar with what the homework problem wants you to do. Um, some of these I use Wolfram Alpha to help me with integration. Uh, you can find that you can do these integrations in Wolfram pretty easily. Where we're going to get to, what we need to get to to finish this chapter out, we're very much interested in gray diffuse surfaces. All right. What is gray? Independent of wavelength. So when we think about the emission as a function of wavelength, down here. If it's a black body, we get this nice shape. What was that equation? Somebody's distribution. Wien's distribution or Planck's distribution? Planck's equation or Planck's distribution. That would be for a black body. And if it's gray, if it's gray, you knock it down by the same percent. Maybe the emissivity uh, is 80%. Uh, well, it's knocked down. The emission is knocked down by 0.8. All right. That's what I'm trying to illustrate here. So for the gray surface, that would be this curve. Same shape, just everywhere knocked down. Then the second term, diffuse. It has no directional preference. It is cosine distributed. And the best illustration for here is that. And again, this is theta. Theta going from 0 to uh, pi over... Uh, 2, pi over 2, and uh, at the, if you put in the cosine of 0, you get 1. If you put in the cosine of pi over 2, you get 0, so it pinches it off. So the, the length of the emission here in this illustration by the length of those arrows is that intensity. This is always an approximation. There's never any truly gray diffuse surface. But if you had to do the math 
with all of the angles and all the wavelengths, it would just be overly cumbersome. So uh, hopefully you got a lot out of it, but this chapter ends with gray diffuse. Again, I emphasize black body, Planck's distribution, Kirchhoff's law, gray diffuse surfaces, no time for environmental radiation, although it's extremely important. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for your attention. Pick up your homeworks on the way out.